Monday, Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, invite someone to attend with you. And then I want to remind you, too, that we have summer events coming up. And the best way that you can register and see the information about those events is go to summer dot odbc dash church dot com of course in the bulletin there's an easy way to get there by just scanning that qr code and then you can register your child for vbs you can see information about teen camp and all other uh, sorts of events so want to remind you about that and then don't forget in two next sunday is mother's day so invite your family to attend with you moms this is a great way to get your children here and then of course um, you can invite your mothers to attend as well and we're going to have a special gift for all moms that are in attendance so that's next sunday don't forget to pick up a card and send it out this week and then in two Sundays, we're going to have Graduate Sunday. So if you know of someone that attends here, maybe you have a son, a daughter, or maybe you're graduating from some, some sort of college, we want to know and we want to recognize you. So contact our church office or see our staff following the service. But that Graduate Recognition Sunday is going to be on May 16th. Of course, look in the weekly events and all that's going on this week. We have concerts for our school. We have our midweek service. And so make sure you're plugged in and make sure you're involved in what's going on here at Open Door Baptist Church. And we'll begin in just a few moments. Hey, church family, don't forget VBS is coming up June 13th through the 17th. And we want you to take advantage of some invite cards that we have out in the lobby. Grab a card, invite somebody to VBS, and make sure that you get signed up. You can fill out on your connection card or see me and make sure that you are signed up to serve. It is going to be a life-changing week. Well, this Wednesday night, we are looking forward to duct tape night in Olympians. So kids can have fun with that and uh, decorating themselves. And we'll be looking forward to that night this Wednesday. Hey, just want to give you an update with Core Student Ministries. I want to invite you to our Wednesday night program at 7 p.m. We have an awesome time. Uh, so show up, be involved, and we would love to see you on at our Wednesday night services. Also with Core Student Ministries, we have our hiking trip coming up May 22nd. Uh, we'll be meeting at the church at 9 a.m. and should be returning around 3, 3.30 uh, that evening. We also, that is a $5 cost to get into the park and also bring a sacked lunch so we can have a picnic lunch there. It's going to be a great time. So plan for that May 22nd. Meet at the church at 9 a.m. Again, we look forward to seeing you every Wednesday at 7 p.m. involved with our course of ministries. Well, good morning. It's good to see you at Open Door this morning. Glad you made it here in the rain and wet roads. And Lord kept you safe. Would you stand with me, though? We've been called to share the light of the gospel. So let's sing this old hymn together. There's the call comes ringing o'er the restless waves. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine. From shore to shore, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us pray that grace may everywhere abound. Send the light, send the light, and the Christ-like spirit everywhere be found. Send the light, send the light, send the light. Shore to shore, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love, send the light, send the light, let us gather jewels for a crown above, send the light, send the light, send the light. shore to shore, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Amen. What a calling to share the light, the fact that we serve a Savior who is mighty to save. Let's sing this together. Everyone needs compassion. 
a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me, and everyone needs forgiveness. The kindness of the Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. find me all my fears and failures fill my life again I give my life to follow everything I believe in now I surrender Say church this morning and we are glad that you're here and this is a busy time of year for our ministries and uh, here at our church this week we're excited about Bible conference this week this Monday and Tuesday at 7 p.m. we're excited to have Pastor Kurt Skelly and I know I promise you you're going to enjoy uh, that and we are so excited to be able to hear from God's word from him and so if you would make it a priority I know God will bless you this week um, for that. So I want to encourage you, and I want to pray for that, pray for a great service this morning, and uh, we just appreciate you being here. If you are visiting this morning, uh, we want to say thank you so much to you, and uh, we would love to encourage you right after the service to step out into the lobby. Our pastor uh, will be out there, and his wife will be able to meet them and uh, be able to uh, just answer any questions that you may have today. Uh, but we're excited that you're here, and we're looking forward to a great morning of worship together. So Brother Shannon's going to come, and we'll pray, and then we'll continue in worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time you've given us, Lord. You've appointed us to be here at this time. We thank you for our, our pastor as he's going to deliver the message today. 
Lord, we know you've spoken to him. We ask that our hearts and our ears be open to your word today and that we'll receive what he has prepared for our pastor. Thank you for the guests who've come, Lord. They've honored us by being here. We thank you for uh, that they've taken their time. We thank you that uh, we, they can be here with us. And, Lord, we just pray that through the services today, through uh, King's Kids, uh, through the service here, Lord, that uh, whatever is said and done will bring honor and glory to you. And, Lord, we just ask that if there's one lost among us that knows you not, Lord, today will be the day of salvation. Lord, lead, guide, and direct in this service and through the week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And then you can be seated.
asking God to work in our midst today. I do want to remind you um, that when you came in this morning, hopefully you got a bulletin. In that bulletin, there's a connecting card. Take some time if you can through the service. Fill that out and put it in the offering plate. Uh, following the service. I know Pastor Ben mentioned about our uh, Bible conference, our mini Bible conference we're having Monday and Tuesday we're looking forward to. And I do want to remind you that we have nursery and preschool care available for up to age, uh, well, kindergarten age. So if you have a young person, you think, man, I'd love to come, but I just have these little ones and it's hard to sometimes get something. Hey, we have a place for them. That way you can just focus on what God has for you. And we hope you'll come back for that. And then don't forget our summer events. There's a place in there that you can uh, uh, scan that and just see a uh, register for VBS and all the summer events that we have coming up. Right now, though, I want our young people, first through sixth grade, this is the place you've been waiting for where you can exit and go to kids' church. So, first through sixth grade, head on back to the back. Everyone else, would you stand with me and let's sing together this song? Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. song that I lean toward over this past year. This is one. I find myself picking it out in school chapel often because I think there's something about songs of declaration. You know, in Matthew 7, it talks about the wise man and the foolish man. 
and there was preparation and there was in a sense a life declaration of where they were going to build their house one built it on a rock and one built it on sand and the fact is when we make declarations in our life that you know what I'm going to do this with my life what happens is eventually what comes the rain comes down and the floods come up. You know that little child song. You probably know, recognize those emotions. But those storms are going to come. And we have to look back in those moments where we say, I will build my life upon you, Jesus. And it's a firm foundation. And I will not be shaken so that when those storms come, the testing, the rains, those, those things that knock us down, we say, no matter what, I am not turning my back on Christ. I'm going to honor him. I'm going to say, holy is the Lord Almighty. I'm going to worship him through the storm. Let's sing this song of declaration. I will build my life upon your love and sing it like you mean it. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. time we can meet together and we can sing songs of testimony, songs about your gospel and the light that we have to send and share with others, Lord, and even songs of encouragement that remind us that when we stand upon you, we stand on a ground that will not be shaken. And so, Lord, as we've declared it this morning, Lord, I pray that you will burn it in our hearts and you'll help us to stand strong in that truth. Lord, I pray that you'll work as we have an opportunity to open your word and to hear it this morning, and we're thankful for that. I ask that you work in my life. Lord, we ask as a church, you work in our church. As a community, we ask that you work in our community, Lord, and that you'll help us to know you better and to share you more and to help others. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. we 
understand one thing. Your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness, that's Christ in me. Lord, I need comes my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Lord I need you oh I need you Thank you very much for that special and song this morning. The truth is, we need Jesus, amen? And uh, we need to love him and grow closer to him each and every day. And I trust that you are doing that. In fact, that's the topic and subject that we'll be noting today. If you would open your Bibles to Revelation chapter number two, and uh, just really had kind of a, a two part little mini series, I guess you could say, last Sunday and today, as we think about the opportunity we have to be the light in the world that God's called us to be. And I trust that you are trying to be that light. Uh, but the fact is, we cannot be that light unless Christ is our light. And so I want to encourage you, in Ephesians chapter number two, we're looking at this uh, sermon. If you happen to be taking notes, which I encourage you to do that. And the fact is, uh, I use the same medicine. When I'm not preaching, I take notes too. So uh, in fact, I, I'm excited about the things that I'm able to learn. I'm excited about the things that God's continuing to do here at Open Door Baptist Church in our ministries. It's an exciting place to be. And a little bit of rain today. Uh, but I'm thankful that we understand a little bit of rain has to fall in every life uh, different times, and hopefully the floods won't come that way. Uh, certainly, we know what floods are like, but we trust Jesus, and I'm thankful for his goodness and his faithfulness to us. Uh, to us. And uh, I want to remind you, as you're turning your Bibles, we're looking at the book of Revelation, chapter number two, and uh, tomorrow and on Tuesday, uh, Pastor Kurt Skelly is going to be here. I hope that you're going to be here. I hope you're already planning on being here. God's going to work, uh, because I know this, when the Word of God is preached, God's going to work, and God's Word will not return void. God has something specific and special for you, and I'm thankful that uh, he's going to uh, be preaching uh, through his Word and through uh, Pastor Kurt Skelly uh, to us the next two days. So that's at 7 o'clock tomorrow and on Tuesday, and excited about that. I hope that you'll be here for it. Uh, here, here's a question. I want you to think about this when it comes to, you've heard the expression, the elephant in the room, right? We start to think about where we are as a church. We start to think about our own relationship with Christ, and when it comes to who we are, here's a question. Is it possible that we could be missing something in plain sight? And when it comes to missing something in plain sight, you might ask how it could be that we could miss that thing. But it's something as large as it could be. It is something that could be subtle, but yet it is also major. Appearances can be extremely deceiving. Such was the case at the church at Ephesus. 
If you look at your Bibles today, at Revelation chapter number two, if you'll stand with me, we'll read the first seven verses. And I'd like to speak to you today about a new return. We see how it is that we see an invitation from Christ to the church at Ephesus to return to him. Revelation chapter number two, follow along as I begin reading in verse number one. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And in case you're wondering what he is talking about there, you can go back to the end of chapter number one and see how it was that Christ was there. Here's what he says in verse number two. I know thy works. And praise the Lord for this. God knows everything. This is a reminder of God's uh, omniscience. He says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars, and has borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. He says in verse 4, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent." But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He says in verse 7, He that hath an ear, let him hear. With the Spirit saith unto the churches, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for these letters that you wrote to these different churches. And We think about this letter that you wrote to the Ephesian church, and we ask that you would help its illustration. We ask that you help us to see its example, what you wrote to her, that you would speak to us today and encourage us to be a church that doesn't have just a form of godliness, doesn't have just a semblance of your power, but Lord, help us to be a church that truly loves you. May the heartbeat of all that goes on in this place, when we sing, when we worship, when we guide and lead young people in our school, in our daycare, as we go out on visitation, as we go from this place and we minister to others and we show the light of Jesus Christ, Lord, I ask that you would help us to be a church, that you would help us to be individuals who are Christians who don't just have the form and semblance and tradition of Christianity, but that we would be a people who in our hearts, first and only first, that we love you. Please bless our time together today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we look at the Word of God today, we're reminded about this church, this church in the city of Ephesus. We think about the church. In fact, the description that's given to us by Jesus Christ is one that if you were to be a visitor or a guest pulling up to this church in any town, it didn't have to be the church at Ephesus, but specifically this church at Ephesus, if you tooled up there with your family and you were going to go visit a church, and here you are pulling into Ephesus, the Ephesian church, and you look at this church, you're like, wow, this church has it all together. This church is awesome. If you weren't a member of the church of Ephesus, you'd be like, "Ah, that's the church that I want to be a part of. It seems like everything seemed to be going just right. She was a church at work doing profitable things for people and making a difference in the Ephesian community. She was a church in the midst of the most important city of Asia Minor. You say, where is Asia Minor? It'd be the equivalent today of about the the, uh, country of Turkey. She was standing against the temple center of Artemis, or Diana, the Greek goddess of fertility that was in Ephesus. And she was able to share the message of hope with sailors who came into the port and travelers who came from around the world as they came in and out of Ephesus' seaport. The church at Ephesus had a rich history. About 40 to 50 years before we read what we see in Revelation 2 is that John recorded this letter. We understand the Apostle Paul spent almost three years planting the church that was there in Ephesus. We start to think about that and how Timothy, Paul's son in the faith, Paul's young protege, He is a man who came and then pastored the Ephesian church after the Apostle Paul had started. And then even afterward, the man who is writing the book of Revelation, we see that John the Apostle pastored the Ephesian church while he wrote the books of the Gospel of John, 
1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, all written while he was probably the pastor there at the church of Ephesus. This was a church that John the Revelator was intimately familiar with. We think about this, too, when it came to the rich heritage and history of the Ephesian church. Let's remember that John was given responsibility for Mary, the mother of Jesus. It is likely that in the membership of the church at Ephesus that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was one of the faithful attendees and members there at that church. You can imagine when it came time for Sunday school. And everybody looking to Jesus, to Mary, and asking questions about her son when it came to when he was little, when it came to the stories about when Jesus died and rose again, and who better to be able to get answers from than Mary. That was a church that had an awesomely rich heritage. We think about John, and while he is writing this book, the book of Revelation, where is he? He is off the coast of Ephesus, uh, exiled on the Isle of Patmos. This was a church that has a rich history and a timeline of when God wrote this letter to her was roughly the time span even of our own church's history. And then, all of a sudden, God makes an evaluation of the church of Ephesus. It seems like everything is going oh so well. And then verse number four here, we turn our attention. We see that Jesus says these words, nevertheless, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. We think about this. We must ask the question, what in the world happened? We must also ask the question, if they were so desperate and far away from Christ, is there a way back? Well, this morning, I want to encourage you. Simple message we find in this text today would be this, is that we must, and I want to encourage you to return back to your first love. Return back to your first love. And we have to ask this question, so how is it that the church at Ephesus got to where she was? How, why, why was it that things were happening the way that they were happening in that church? Well, number one today, when it comes to returning to your first love, we have to understand a little bit about this history. And number one today, we have to go from routine, or we understand what happened is they went from routine to rundown. They went from routine to rundown. We think about the nature of churches and organizations, especially we think about what it is that God is doing through his vibrant community of believers, his called out assembly, his ecclesia. We think about the church. And when it comes to church, we understand that churches may have history. Churches may even have a semblance of position. Churches may even espouse certain traditions. And we understand that they could bring a little bit of value. But understand history, position, and tradition, they matter about as much as the gum on the bottom of your shoe when they represent, and we start to think about the present, and when we think about eternity, if those things are void of the presence of Jesus Christ. When it comes to the Ephesian church, she was once commended for her love. If we were to go back earlier, we remember the letter that was written to the Ephesian church by the Apostle Paul. In Ephesus, in the book of Ephesians, he says, Ephesians 1.15, he says, Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, he says, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. In that same letter in chapter 6, verse 24, he ends by saying this, grace be with them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. We could look then and remember that the apostle Paul Although the church was built and founded and established on the foundation of knowing Christ and walking with him in love, the Apostle Paul encouraged the church to continue to grow in their love for Jesus Christ when he wrote in Ephesians 4, 2, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, he says, forbearing one another in love. Elsewhere in that chapter, in verse number 15, we see where he says, but speaking, you know what I'm going to say, but speaking the truth, how? In love. May grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, 
according to the effectual working, the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in what? Love. Love is so important. A generation later, not too much longer hence after the church had been planted and the church was growing in a great foundation of knowing Jesus Christ and loving Jesus Christ, something changed. The church was looking great on the outside, maybe not just in her building, but in the way that the church was functioning. But Revelation 2 reminds us that she lost her love for her Savior. Note what she was known for. We can see in our passage that the Ephesian church was patient, simply meaning this, that they were faithful to Jesus Christ no matter the times that they were facing. What else was she known for? She was known because they resisted the pressures of those who tried to introduce new doctrine in the church because these people would come and they would claim to be apostles. And when it came to looking at them, they said, you're not an apostle. And they tried the things that they were trying to speak to them about. And they found those false apostles to be liars. What happened? Well, we understand that they resisted those pressures. And over time, slowly, Subtly, this church became focused on her orthodoxy, her doctrines, her traditions, her heritage, her good old days, her standards, her faithful work for God. It became about rules. It became about what to do. It became about what to believe, when to do things, how to do them, and also that God would be pleased with them, forgetting that God is already pleased with his saints due to their relationship that was afforded only from the finished work of Jesus Christ. The Ephesian church was slipping away to being like the Galatian church, where the apostle Paul wrote to whom? These folks, who were, they certainly were strong in doctrine, and he, we understand that they favored religion over a relationship. The Apostle Paul wondered if the church of Galatia had gone mad seeing their departure from Christ and rhetorically asked this question in Galatians 3.1. He said, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, but before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently sent forth, crucified among you? We think about this church. And religion is always telling us the 10 or more things that we should or should not do. And we understand when it comes to lists of do's and don'ts, following those lists becomes very wearisome. But why is it that we do religious things when we get so crushed by the weight of those things? It's because we feel guilty. It is because of this desire that I have to do this because if I don't, then somebody's going to call me. If I don't do this, then I'm not going to look like a Christian. If I don't do this or if I do this other thing, then God will not hear my prayer. If I do or if I don't, when it comes to these checklists, all of a sudden I have this guilt pressure that is in my life. And when it came to the church, they went from routine they were doing all the right things seemingly on the outside, but because of the pressure of trying to do what they thought was right, they became run down because they lost their heart, their passion, their fervor for Jesus Christ. We may think the pressure that we feel guilty comes from God, from others, or from ourselves personally. But religion comes in and puts in a place of structure. It puts in a routine that replaces vitality and f the freshness of walking in the Spirit. And soon, form, preservation, and protecting the things that we do because it's the way it's been done becomes our security. It becomes our identity by which we see our own selves as Christ followers. And then we can easily become judgmental, also of those who fit on the outside of the mold of the structure that we have made. By the way, 
This is not just something that is possible for the Ephesian church or for the Galatian church. This is something that is very real in our own hearts as well. If you think about it, Jesus' harshest words, when he was here at his first advent, when he was preaching to those who were around, we remember that Jesus' harshest words were levied against the religious leaders of the time, specifically the scribes and the Pharisees. Why? Because these people, they loved to pray. They loved to read the Bible. And they loved to give great sums of money. It sounds like those are pretty good traits for Christians, are they not? But at the same time, they were not giving with a heart that was in tune with Jesus Christ. They did it so that God and others would see them. And it was an outward show. And the outside was good, but the heart was run down. It was a place full of cobwebs and empty halls. And by the way, it can happen in our lives too. God does not want you to try to be religious. Some of us, that's all we know. From the earliest of stages and ages of our lives, sometimes when we're brought up, it's like we have to go to church, right? Well, the fact is this, and by the way, parents, when it comes to your kids and saying, I have to go to church, let me re encourage you to change their phraseology and say something more like this, we get to go to church, amen? Amen. When it comes to having a heart, that's the difference. It's not I have to go to church. Hey, religion is having to go to church so that God's gonna be happy with me. I hope you didn't come to church today to make God happy with you. The fact is this, if you know Jesus as your savior, he's already happy with you. We have come to this place knowing the fact that we, in our hearts, as we lift up God, we have an opportunity to be able to worship God together. And we do so with a heart of joy, with a heart of gratitude, with a heart of thanks, not begging that God, please, please be happy with me. That's not why we are here today. If you know Christ, understand that yes, you would be a sinner. We're all sinners. But we know this too, that in Jesus Christ, we know that God sees Christ's righteousness, not our sinfulness. What is the hope then? Is there even hope that can help us to move forward? We look at our passage in Revelation 2, and it reminds us here, he says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. You know, Jesus could have stopped right there. But aren't you thankful that he continued to write his letter to the Ephesian church to remind us that there's something beyond? He says in verse number five, he says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. So this morning we understand that God has something for us. There's something that he describes for us here. In fact, 2 Timothy 3.17 says this, now, the Lord is that spirit. He says, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We talk about a church that kind of goes into the, the ideas, the routines, and eventually gets run down. That's not the way that God wants us to live, folks. God wants us to have a different heart. God wants to change some things. God wants us to have liberty as we follow the spirit of Jesus Christ, as we learn to walk in him, as we follow his word and we love others, as we love Jesus Christ. We think about this and how do we go from this number two today? We go from the gutter of guilt to the glory of grace. When it comes going from guilt and being that our motivation of every day, well, I've got to read my Bible because my Sunday school teacher may ask me about it. Or if I don't read my Bible, God just not going to be happy with me. Where I, had a, I try to do this and I try to do that. Hold on a second, folks. Our motivation needs to be so much different than guilt. Guilt is not the best motivator, is it? Now, oftentimes we try to guilt people into doing things. And uh, let me just be very, very candid with you. That's not the best motivator. In Jesus Christ, we ought to do things. It's not a whole lot better when our families work together. We strive to be able to do things together because we do it out of love, not guilt. Right? When it comes to that relationship that we have with Jesus Christ, that was, that's what he's trying to remind the church here of Ephesus is that they need to move from the gutter of guilt to the glory of walking together in Jesus Christ in his grace. He says in verse number six, he says, but this 
thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. When it comes to this, this passion, yes, they had some passion, but it was waning. It was starting to die. And the Lord is reminding them, come back to me. So how do we get back to making Jesus Christ then the first love of our lives? And by the way, before I get to that point and remind you about how to do that, I want to stop here to just point out the fact that if you haven't gotten to know Christ yet for the first time, that's where you need to start. When it comes to this passage right here in Ephesians 2, it's reminding a church, it's reminding people who have already trusted in Jesus Christ, but people who have fallen away from their love with Jesus Christ. So understand, some of you may be here today or maybe watching today, and we understand you must first, if you don't know Christ, you need to know him first. But when it comes to those of you who are here today and you say, yes, I have placed my trust in Jesus Christ. I have been saved. Yes, there was a time that once I was, uh, began my journey and my walk with Jesus Christ, I can remember it clearly. For those of you who have wandered away and you say today, I do not love Christ the way I need to. It is time to come back to him. For those who are saved, let me remind you, and perhaps you think about even as the righteous brother is saying, you've lost that love and feeling. By the way, love is not just a feeling. In fact, the world talks about feelings all the time. And when it comes to Jesus Christ, sometimes we're thinking, well, I've just kind of fallen out of love with him. We think about having all these emotional uh, things in our lives. It doesn't always start with emotions. You understand that? It begins with a choice. The foundation of love is a choice. The foundation of that choice says, at least on God's front when he looks at us, he says, you are unlovable, but I am choosing to love you. Aren't you thankful that Jesus decided to do that? He died on the cross of Calvary. He died on the cross of Calvary, and he said this, you can't earn your way to heaven. You can't pay me enough to get into heaven. So because of that, I am going to die on the cross of Calvary for you to purchase your salvation. That's exactly what Jesus did. And so now, those of us who know Christ is because we've come to him. We have received that wonderful gift that he has afforded to us, that gift we could never, ever pay for. And he has redeemed us. And by the way, if you're here today and you've not yet trusted in Christ, I beg you, I plead you to you to come to know him today. But many, there are many times that I've had opportunities, I think most of us have, to be able to do some of that counseling where somebody comes up to you and Maybe they just kind of bend your ear for a little bit and they say, hey, I just don't know what's going on. I've got some troubles uh, in, in my home, in my marriage, in my family. You ever hear something like this where a couple or somebody just comes up to you and says, you know what, when it comes to our relationship, it, 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 I guess we, we just fell out of love. How many times have I heard that? Lots. When it comes to our relationship with God, it's the same way. We can also fall out of love with Jesus Christ. And this is the very starting point that we see in our passage in verse number five, where he shows us this. He says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. That's the starting point. If I can say it to you this way, when it comes to going from the gutter of guilt to the glory of grace, we need to remember our first love. Remember your first love. Let me ask you to go back to that day, to go back to that time. For some of you, that is shorter or longer than others. I remember that day on April 19th, 1985. That day when my mom shared the gospel with me before I ran off to my uh, elementary school class that day. My mom shared the gospel with me, and that day I trusted in Jesus as my Savior. I hope that you have a similar testimony. It's going to sound different, different places, different spaces, different faces for different people, right? except for this. The story is the same because it all comes together at the cross of Jesus Christ. Do you remember that time that you trusted Jesus Christ? That time where you remembered and re you were reminded of the fact that you were a sinner? That time where you came to Jesus and you reminded yourself about the scriptures and how it shows you that Jesus Christ died for your sin, and then you trusted and you received Christ as your Savior, and guess what? You were pretty excited. How you were pretty excited to get saved? Say amen. It's an exciting thing when Jesus changes your life, to know that you're no longer on the path to hell, but you're on your way to heaven, to know that Jesus is with you at every moment of every day, and to know that 
he will never leave you or forsake you, that he is going to guide you throughout life. When it came to that day and that time when you trusted in Christ as your savior, you wanted people to make up extra time for church. You remember that? It's kind of like, hey, I mean, we have to go home from church right now, or do, are we going to meet tomorrow? It's Monday. We don't really have a church service on Monday. It's like, oh man, I have to wait till Wednesday to go to church, right? When it came to church, he's like, when can I meet with other people? When can I grow in Jesus Christ? You memorized verses. You took notes in church. You invited people to know Christ, and you're like, I don't know how to tell you about all this. All I know to tell you is I was lost, and now I'm saved, You're like, come here about Jesus. Come and find out who he is. You invited people to church. You let God help you stop sinning. When it came to certain things in your life, you're like, I I just need to learn how to stop that. Some of you really knew how to cuss like sailors, and now Jesus has changed the way you talk, amen? When it comes to the way that God worked in your life, you started watching your language. You wanted to keep yourself unspotted from the world. You exchanged your worldly friends for church ones. That's kind of a strange transition, isn't it? You're ready to follow Jesus to the ends of the earth. Like, Lord, call me to be a missionary. Tell me to go anywhere and I'll follow you. You were just excited about following Jesus wherever and whatever God asked you to do. But eventually, things began to cool down. And that doesn't always seem like it's so exciting to follow Jesus. It's easy to go through the motions eventually. You know, God's there, but you go through the checklist. And you ask the question at the end of the day, have I been a good Christian today? Soon, when we used to not be able to get enough of God, we started limiting what we do for God by saying such things as, well, I served, I gave, I did my thing. That's enough. But how does your heart and relationship look right now compared to that time when you first came to know Christ and he was the first love of your life? Secondly, we understand not only do we remember, we must also, verse number five, repent. He says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent. By the way, let me remind you that repenting means to take ownership of your relationship and to go back. What got you so far away from living like Christ, from loving God like you used to love him? It's supposed to be, as the song says, The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. For the church at Ephesus, perhaps for you and for me, is Jesus the one true love of your life? Let me encourage you today to understand that even as Christians, yes, we still sin. Repent of your sin, Jesus tells us. He reminds us that unholy living is the surest way to estrange your heart from God. Repent of laziness. Relationships take work, and you probably take time perhaps to check your Facebook page, perhaps to do so to snoop on others or to see how many likes you got for the rant that you recently posted. But when it comes to having a heart for God, we must take time to seek Him. Repent of thinking God is happier with you because you look the part rather than live the part of having a heart for Christ. Repent of loving this present world and its alluring trinkets more than the being and trusting Christ as the lover of your soul. Repent of turning your back on God when he led you through a tough time so that you would know his perfect and peace-giving presence. Repent. And by the way, I'm not going to pretend to be able to list all the things that we might need to repent of today for all the reasons why we may have left Christ. But if we have fallen from Christ as our first love, the Word of God reminds us 
to repent, to turn, to turn away from those things that drove us away from him and to turn back to Christ and to follow him and to love him as our first love. And when we repent, God restores and forgives his children. And then what? One final thought, the redo. We look at our text in verse number four, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent. Then he says, and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly. We think about the opportunity of doing the first works. How many of you have ever tried something new? Maybe a new recipe, maybe a new sport, maybe a new game or whatever it might be. And all of a sudden you have this thing that you're trying to do, it's the very first time. You ever played horseshoes? You're like, hold on, let me try this again, right? When it comes to, when it comes to how many of you have ever played golf? You know what I'm talking about? Chasing this little white ball around a, a, a big field, like you hit the ball and it like goes off into the swamp somewhere or something like that. You hit this little ball and you're like, hold on a second, can I have a, a do-over? Right? In, in golf, I think they call it a gimme, right? And you're like, hey, I've got another ball. Forget where that one went. Let's put another one here. Let's try that over again. When it comes to Jesus Christ, praise the Lord for this opportunity. If we remember that we have wandered away from Christ and then we repent of our sin, guess what? You know what God does? He says, let's do this again. Let's start all over. Aren't you thankful for the do-overs that God gives to you? To understand that today can be a day that is a do-over. It's the beginning of starting to do things all over again for Jesus Christ. The work is not our work. It is the first works of Jesus Christ, the work that God did in our lives to save us and to sanctify us, the one we were initially excited about. It is he whom we love, and it is returning to the relationship of knowing God, not just doing a religious duty. Sometimes in our minds, like, oh, doing the first work, that means I need to go to church more. Hold on a second, folks. We've got to be careful about that. I'm not, I'm not telling you to not come to church. I'm telling you to come to church for the right reason. I'm telling you, I'm going to encourage you to read the Bible for the right reason. Don't just read it just to read it, but read it to meet with God. I want to encourage you to pray again and seek God's face and let God speak to you and you speak to him and bring your burdens to him. No, don't just pray because it's a religious ritual, but connect with God at a heart level. Why? Because you want to spend time with him. It's been a little while, but I think I've told you some of the stories about when my wife and I first met and when we were writing to each other. We were separated over lots of distance when we were first writing, and I guess you could say, say dating, but it's kind of a little hard to date over 800 miles away. And, and we had a lot of phone calls. We had, wrote a lot of letters. That was the days before email. I tried to email her, but she didn't have email yet, so I had to send faxes and stuff like that just to be able to try to communicate. The fact is this. The day, that we, or the day before we got married, I wrote a check to my parents to pay off my long-distance phone bill. You know why? Because I wanted to get to know her. And when it comes to our relationship with God, it ought to be worth the expense. It ought to be worth the time. It ought to be worth your energy, your fervor, and your passion to want to get alone with God Almighty so that you can know him. But sometimes it seems like, hey, after the beginning, after the honeymoon stage is over, it seems like we back up from God and all of a sudden we have interests in other places and things that move us away from God. And we are okay doing the spiritual thing so that we look like we play the part, but we really don't have God in our lives. Yes, we're saved. We're on our way to heaven. I've got a great fire escape, if you will, but hold on a second. Jesus is more than a fire escape. Jesus is your Savior. He is the lover of your soul, and he, he wants you to know him. I want to encourage you today, in many of our lives, needs to be the day of starting over. They say, what if I blow it today? Start over tomorrow. We say, what if I blow it tomorrow? Keep on starting over because Jesus gives you the opportunity to remember who your first love is. You repent and you come back and God says this, do, redo the first works. What is it that drove you to Jesus Christ in the first place? What is it in the energy, the fervor, the excitement of knowing him in those early days that would draw you back 
to him. Rekindle that fire in your heart and your lives for him. I use the golf analogy. Jack Nicholas in 1979, he didn't win any tournaments, but many of you know who Jack Nicholas is. Probably one of the best golfers that's ever lived. But 1979, he had a hard time winning any tournaments at all. You know what he did? He went back to his first original coach, and here's what he asked him. He said, coach, I can't remember his name. He said, would you teach me how to play the game of golf again? Some of us, you know what we need to do? We need to come back to Jesus again and relearn how to walk with Christ again. It seems like all the programming and all the things that we do in our lives, that we've organized our lives in such a way that we can play the part of a Christian, but our heart can still be so far away from Jesus Christ. I ask you today, will you begin a time of new returning to the Lord? I believe in our day, in our age, in our time, we need Christians. Christ wants us to take a step up and to follow him, because many Christians have hearts that are far from their Savior. And here we are together as a church, and we're reading a letter about another church that's much like our church just 1,900 years later. And if the things that happened in the church 1,900 years ago happened then, guess what? Our church can be the same way. And I know that God has been working in hearts and I believe that God's invitation is timely today because the consequences of drifting from God is since the church belongs to him that he can take away our candlestick. And the fact is this, we can call this place Open Door Baptist Church, but if Jesus takes away our candlestick, it is only a church in name, but she is missing what makes the church. Jesus Christ is the center of it all. And if we don't worship him and we don't invite him and we just go about and we do what we're doing because we say that we are a church, just calling us a church doesn't make us a church. You know how easy it is to write a letter to the state of Louisiana and say we're starting a church? Any one of you could do it. But just because you're incorporated as a church in Louisiana does not make you a church. Just because we have a sign on the interstate, just because we're trying to put a sign at the corner that says Open Door Baptist Church does not make us a church. We are an ecclesia, as I used that term earlier. We are a called out assembly. And who calls us out? The pastor? No. The one who calls us out, his name is Jesus. 2,000 years ago, he died on the cross of Calvary, and ever since then, through the power of his word, through the power of his Holy Spirit, he has been calling, and he has been saving individuals to come and to know him, and he's still reaching, he is still saving, he's still calling people out of this world to assemble and to be a part of a church family today. Why? Because the church is God's happening place. But if Jesus is gone, and we just go through the form and function the traditions, the heritage, the stories of the past. And we don't let this place be about Jesus. It's not a church. Church family, do you want Jesus in this place? I think we would all say yes. The difference is not just saying it, but doing it. Remember Jesus' words right here, they echo what he said many times when he told parables. He said, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the seven churches, which reading this letter today, Christ is speaking to us. Don't think about your neighbor. I want you to think about you just for a moment. How is your relationship with Christ? Do you really love him today? like you loved him when you first got saved. And if there's anything less, Christ calls us to remember that, to repent, and then today to redo, come back to him and let him change our lives to make a difference this morning.
Would you bow your heads with a word of prayer today? Lord, I thank you for an opportunity to look into your word and to hear your wonderful words, to hear your awesome invitation that shows us that we can come back to you. Lord, the invitation that reminds us that you ought to be the first love of our lives. Lord, help us in this moment, in this time, to be a part of doing something that's very special, that's coming back to you. Lord, my prayer, you know my heart, Lord. As a pastor of this church, my prayer is that our church would be a church that says, Christ, we want you here. We don't just wanna go through the form and the fancy functions that go on, the traditions of the church and the heritage of the church, wonderful things, but this is not a church without you. And we plead that your presence would be here. And right now, I pray for our church family that you would help us to know you as our Lord, as our Savior, as our King, as the wonderful Lord of our lives. Lord, we ask that you would help us to invite you back personally in our lives and collectively as a church family. This morning, we... Friend, thank you so much for watching this service. I'm so grateful to be the pastor of Open Door Baptist Church and to share the message that you just heard. It was a message from the Bible, God's holy word. It's an old book and it's true today, just like when it was written. And I promise if you will trust its principles, God will direct your steps and bless you just like this book says he will do. And God invites us in his word to know him, not just in an informational way, but personally. And this is why God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to show his love to us by dying on the cross. It was on the cross that Jesus paid the price for the whole world's sins, including ours. It was after Jesus laid down his life then that he had the power as God to take it back again, and he rose again from the dead. We know this, he's alive today. In fact, the Bible says and summarizes the gospel when it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I invite you to know God. Since Jesus paid for your sins, it's completely free. Really, knowing God, getting saved, it only takes a few moments of your time. It also involves humility as a sinner to know that you cannot earn a way to know God by doing anything. God offers his very expensive, yet free to us gift of salvation to those who will simply accept his invitation to know him and follow him the rest of their lives. If this describes you, we prepared a free resource to guide you at your own pace into understanding and taking that step to trust Christ as your own savior. You can know God today. In fact, you can check it out at start.odbc-church.com or you may contact us by phone or by writing to us. If what you've heard by this service was a blessing, please share it with others. It's viewers like you who spread the word that make a difference in our world. Well, until I see you next time, my prayer is that you will be joyfully blessed and guided by God's word.